coming to, to this uh, yeah to, to, to this afternoon session and uh, spending with us. Um, just want to say um, that um, I came here a couple of times um, before and, and gave a talk as well, uh, organised by a really dear colleague and who became a friend as well, Peter Standing. And I uh, like this presentation to dedicate to, to his memory, um, especially because we're talking about engaging people and measurements that he was so keen about. But I'm quite emotional actually to come here <laughs> um, after so long time, actually, last time that Peter was still with us. Um, but I'll, so I'm Susie Illich, I'm uh, from Lancaster Environment Centre. On teaching coastal processes, and here are my colleagues. They will introduce themselves. Um, my name is Liz Edwards, and I'm in the Future Places Centre at Lancaster University, which is an interdisciplinary group. And I think over the last few weeks, you've heard some people from FPC speaking. Um, my background is originally in teaching. I was a geography teacher. I'm retrained as a digital designer, and uh, my current work, I'm not a lecturer, I'm a researcher. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to hand you over to Susie. Sorry, to Su 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 Serena. <laughs> Sorry. Normally, you get these right. But yeah, I'm Serena for last year, and I'm a lecturer in design, of all things. And um, I, I initially got the group together for this project, which is quite a strange and very, very interdisciplinary project. The fourth person that's named there who's not here today is Joseph Herr. Um, he works with Susie. Um, he's, an, he's a geographer um, and a PhD student and um, he's interested in um, citizen science and again involving people in data collection about the coast and the beach and so on. So then what happened is that about a couple of years ago the Arts and Humanities Research Council, so that's my read, had this call out um, asking for projects that engage young people in research on climate change. Um, it seemed quite an unusual call because in a sense when you think about climate change um, you think of science subjects, geography and so on, but then um, the call was in the design field and it was specifically about designing ways to get people to engage with research, to make research accessible to them, and get them to find languages and ways and tools so that they can enter the conversation. Because young people tend to be quite um, discouraged from um, engaging with issues of climate change because all the problems seem so big for them, and there's going to be some experts somewhere that's going to sort them out. Um, but our project is all about demonstrating that that's not necessarily the case and that young people can have a place in the conversation given the right tools. So, um, climate change, but we focused on coastal processes, so that's why Susie and Joseph were um, really key to this project. Um, for a number of reasons, one of them is because we all live around Morecambe Bay and so the schools that we engaged with had direct access to the coast. But also because of all the places that are going to be affected by climate change, coastal areas are the ones that we feel the most uh, impact. From sea level rise, acidification, extreme weather events, flooding and so on. So there is a connection and an entanglement of um, things that will contribute to uh, environmental change in coastal areas. The other thing is that we know, we have some ideas of climate predictions. We know what might happen, but what will make the most significant change to the coast is decisions that will be taken at local policy level. So if you know that a place is at risk of being flooded, what do you do? You can build a seawall or flood retention walls, like the one on the left, um, or perhaps you can encourage salt marshes and leave space for water. Um, these are two uh, extremely valid examples. Um, both of them uh, are valid in, in, in coastal contexts, uh, but they have very different implications for communities that live around the area. 
So communities, what we argue, is that they need to be involved in decision-making processes because it is about uh, their livelihood, ultimately. And the thing of engaging with community is that um, I like this term, which is discourse porosity. When you think about place, um, you have processes, coastal processes, um, climate patterns, and so on. You have uh, political bodies that are uh, they have a voice and have a say and have an impact on decisions. You have social practices. You have cultures. You have structures that have been built at some point in time that are still there. And all of these things are entangled with each other. You also have the lives of non-human organisms around the coast. All of these entities are somehow connected and entangled with each other, but they are also, um, there's a viscosity to this porosity. They don't really seamlessly talk to each other. There's like also resistances. Um, so certain, certain solutions might be perfectly appropriate for a particular place, but they don't work because there's no community support or because they might impact some other elements of place. So this project is about bringing young, young people to engage with this complexity and understanding the ways in which we might need to make decisions in the future um, and get them to experiment with these complexities and controversies and get them to like imagine these possible futures engaging with these And because young people are the ones that will be directly affected by these changes and by decisions that are being taken now. Um, but again, um, teenagers tend to be quite disconnected from the conversation. It's daunting, it feels like it's not for them. Um, we work with schools around Morecambe Bay. Um, so we work with Carnford High School. Morgan Bay Academy, Bay Leadership Academy, and Lancaster and Morgan College. Each school adopted one portion of the coast, um, and they studied patterns of coastal change, things that have happened in the past, uh, ways in which the coast is behaving right now, and possible data about the future, for the very specific location, so that ideas of climate change are not abstract ideas out there, but stuff that is about the areas where they live. Um, in a lot of these schools, um, many of the students never had exposure to anything like this. Um, university, it's something that, frankly, they don't feel it's for them. Um, they don't feel that they can really be engaged into this conversation. So that, for example, one student from Lancaster and Morton College, when we went out to Sunderland, we gave them like a little map to kind of uh, talk about where we were going to go. And she just like gave it back to me, say like, I failed my GCSEs geography, I can't do this. And I'm like, oh, no, but no, we're going to have to work for a while. So there's like a very strong resistance to engage because it really does feel like it's not for them. So our job was to produce and design the tools that we promote this engagement. Um, we didn't do this alone. Uh, we had partners in this project because we needed data. So we wanted to have data about what might happen in the future. So we needed strong data about predictions and possible strategies. These are listed in the shoreline management plans. Susie is an expert in this area and she linked us up with the Northwest Regional Coastal Monitoring Program, which has had like a name that just rolls from the top, <laughs> um, and Lancaster City Council. Then we wanted to have historical data because things that are in place now have been built somewhere in the past. So we wanted to know how past changes affect the way in which places look now and how patterns of change is something that has always happened. Um, to places. So we wanted photographs, documents, personal history. So we talked to archives and the Maritime Museum and Asian Heritage Associations. They've been brilliant. And then we wanted to make sure that we have good data about monitoring. So what's happening now? Understanding current patterns of change through data collection and observation. So the Environment Agency helped us uh, to put that in place. And as we introduced us uh, before, this is our team. Um, and as you can see, it's quite an interdisciplinary team. 
we went into school, each one of us sort of uh, took charge of one aspect of the project um, and led one of the sessions that were delivered into school. And um, so Liz is, um, she has a background in education as she mentioned. So um, she was uh, able to kind of help us also link whatever we did with the curriculum uh, that was being developed in school. So it was relevant. Uh, for the students as an educational strategy as well. And she's going to present it a little bit. Okay, so as Serena said, one of the reasons we were doing this is because uh, children... Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, there's reports of um, climate anxiety amongst young people in schools, and sometimes that, that's because they're not seeing possible ways that they can get involved in, in futures and making decisions. And also, um, there are sometimes in, in schools, climate change can be taught as an example of something happening somewhere else. So when we did an initial sessions in schools, we started talking about issues to do with climate change. And a lot of the themes that came out were things to do with Antarctica and polar, polar ice caps melting and things that were somewhere else. And the impacts that were likely to happen in the local area were less, were less prominent in people's minds. And so that's what we were trying to do is to bring that into people's consciousness. So the first thing we did was, um, it should, I should say that we were working with 14 to 18 year olds and the older um, it, it's sixth form age uh, young people at Lancaster like Walker College were art students and the, the children at the other schools, some of them were geography but year nines, they, they weren't doing GCSE. Um, and some of them were, some of them were also doing art, and it was a strange um, because at that it, because in secondary you are it's it's harder to organise interdisciplinary work than it is in primary schools because of the way um, the, the curriculum is organised. We in some schools we had a s selection of children who were pulled out to do the project. Um, sometimes because they had a particular interest in it, there were, there were various reasons why the, why the schools selected the groups that they were going to work with us. So the first thing we did was uh, we did some field work. So uh, we went out to the four different sites with the, the group that was responsible for that site and we went for a walk and we had maps and we annotated on the maps uh, things that were of interest. and that was not just, it, it was about the social and the historical and the cultural as well as evidence of uh, prior flooding. So Joseph uh, led in talking about um, uh, flood risk engineering and we looked at the developments, the evidence of past floods and we marked those on maps to kind of show that this is not a new thing, this is a thing that we have lived with and we are going to live with, with more. We also looked for birds in the area. We looked for non-human nature and plants that were in the area to think about inter interrelationships. We looked at the activities that people were doing in the different sites because the aim of the project is to think about futures and we wanted to think about what Morecambe might be like in the future, what it could be like in the future, what was a desirable future, an anticipated future. And so that's part of the social, you know, what jobs are people doing, how are people using the spaces. So we, we walked to the different sites, at the different sites and recorded on maps and collected, collected things that would be useful for telling stories back to the classroom. And in the classroom, we made collective maps. So individuals made maps when we were outside, when we got back to class. Uh, we made collective maps that brought together things that people had found, things that people had seen, thought were interesting. And that was the, um, so that was the session on the present. And then we were really um, kindly supported by um, 
Beesham Heritage Centre by both the Maritime Museum and the Town Museum of Lancaster in finding resources for us that showed um, the history of the bay in different places. And they gave us a stack of images and texts to work with. And what we did was um, we did different activities to get the young people to map out change. So, um, for example, mapping how transport has changed in the area. In order to think about what transport infrastructures might look like in the future, we looked at um, jobs and how, for example, in, in Morecambe, how it, the industry has changed from ship breaking and, uh, um, and, and primary industries, I guess, through to the tourism and, and beyond. And, uh, and we made timelines to look at how things have changed. So that when we're thinking about the future, we're thinking about it in a context. And, and also with both of these things, I didn't bring out, part, part of this is about bringing the children's lived experience into it. So um, in terms of the walks, some people had never been to the sites before. I think I, no, none of the young people have been to Sunderland Point. No, no one had been there, despite most of the young people living there all their lives. Um, and some didn't know the other sites very well either. Others did, and others told us stories. And when it came to the history, it, the young people would tell us about their parents, their grandparents, the things they'd done when they were young, things that were missing, things that they would like to see, and they, their experience was very much part of it. And then the next session was about thinking about futures. And I might pass on to, to Susie for this. You know, so you started to get the idea of why timescape. So we're moving from the past into, into present day and also what the future should bring us. I think the exercise that uh, Lise just was um, talking about was really making students aware of complexity. So it's not just what the natural processes are doing around us, but also what we do and how we influence these natural processes. And that's kind of that exercise of bringing together what, you know, what activities were and what, what the nature looked like in the past, kind of prepare them in a way to look at the things for the future, because future is quite uncertain, complex and uncertain. And we um, introduce them to um, climate change predictions. And as you probably know, they're very uncertain. It really depends what we are going to do uh, with our emissions or with our economy or how we are going to, to live or adapt to, to climate change. And really depending on that, depends how much, you know, the pressure temperature will rise and how the ocean will react to that. So we introduce some of the uh, climate change uh, sea level rise predictions, which I'll probably show you later a little bit the graph as well which, you know, it could be anything from 40 centimeters to one meter. So how do, you, how do you account for that? How do you account for that change? Which, um, you don't know whether it's going to be coming to your doorstep or to your window. Is it going to come in 10 years or 100 years? So that's a really something that, you know, we need to live on and, and, and think about. The other thing as well, um, we are living now in the very modern world. We are getting so much data, uh, data in around UK. So in the last 20 years, the government did um, put a lot of funding into getting information on waves and currents and uh, sea level. Um, so that's all available. And I think that was one of the things that we work with teachers and the students that what can you make out from the data that is already available. Another layer is there that actually climate change predictions are out there as well. And you've probably been aware that you know, it's been already in newspapers and uh, some, some really interesting stories about what's going to happen with us. But actually, those predictions, as I said, are earlier uncertain, but they are available. And, um, and they're coming out from very serious work from intergovernmental um, panel on climate change. 
and then NASA is using to, to predict some of the models. And the models are probably not wrong, but we need to know their limitations, and there are a lot of limitations in it, and then really depending on that limitations, what we can do with that. So I think it was really awareness about, okay, data is available, but what that data means and what we can do with that. And then the next stage is really moving what we can do with, with um, if the things are changing, things are happening, what we could do uh, about. We started with um, playing with some of the scenarios and were better than in just kind of a small wave tank. So the students in the groups can start to think about scenarios that they want to play, how they want to protect uh, a piece of the coastline. And of course, it's not surprising, everybody's starting with sea walls and something that are well known, you know, very concrete or, or rocky structures that we are used to it. But then kind of we push them a little bit further and talk about how about some other solutions and so, you know, maybe just kind of making space for water, perhaps using natural based solutions um, and how that, how that would work. And it was good fun because, you know, in some of the groups I think we have here, it was all about um, saving a sheep. So we had the Lego, um, uh, Lego blocks, um, they could build the houses, but they're also having some persons and sheep are obviously um, favor of the day. So everybody was trying to save them from sea lemon rice and soreness. And here is a little sheep there on the side. Um, but I think that's kind of prepared them to think about how the place would look like and what they would like to do with. Um, and we get some brilliant ideas um, um, from those kind of workshops that follow from this. And I'm going to give back to Serena to uh, explain what work uh, students produce. Yeah, so I guess uh, the, 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 you, you might have understood so far that um, everything that we did was quite hands on. And it was also like a way for us to demystify. Um, the way in which uh, research is done. It's very serious, there's data. Um, Susie did an amazing masterclass on climate prediction where like, she showed data, she worked pictures of like massive wave tanks, how things are prototyped, but it kind of got students into the understanding of nothing is set in stone, there are conversations here. Um, they understood the dynamics and the processes. And then it was time to get them to kind of uh, engage with them. And we worked with their art teachers, as well as um, with an artist, uh, Karen Lester, who has done some work around the Bay, um, that showed them how she engaged with similar uh, dynamics. Um, each school, um, because it was part of their art curriculum for most of them, each school chose to um, use one particular technique or skill that um, art teachers were teaching at that particular time. Um, but what they did is they took pictures that they themselves took on the days of our field work. They took the data that they understood by then. Um, they took images that we collected from the museum, put them together to design scenarios of what could be possible. Now, the thing to understand about these scenarios is that while some of the students um, went for uh, like dreamlike kind of very positive scenarios of um, you know we're gonna build very tall towers and we're gonna live in the air and everything will be great. Um, not all the um, not all the artworks are about things that students would like to see. Some of them were kind of representations of conversations that we had in class. Um, this is Sunderland Point. Fun fact, we presented this project in Sunderland Point to the local community and somebody there said, that's my house. Um, but the point is, and even that person appreciated the fact that um, she wasn't trying to say we should just let everything go. Um, but she created this artwork talking about how sometimes what humans can't defend can become a habitat for other species. And so how do we work through this complexity, how do we prioritize, for example, biodiversity or human habitations and the economy and uh, people's livelihood, really. Um, so this is a representation of that type of discussion which we did have um, with that particular group. 
Some students um, went full on um, architecture and engineering. Uh, these two people um, reimagined a caravan site close to Hasbank um, in the future. So it's all going to be um, off grid using tidal energy to power these um, glamping sites on stilts. Um, which, you know, it's actually, it's quite an interesting idea if you think about, it comes from a 13 year old who is engaging with sea level rising and thinking about how do we vacation, how do we do our holidays in that sea level. Some others went quite tongue in cheek. Um, this is one of my favorite, I have to say. So Adam was saying, um, well, we can just like put a massive flood wall in Sunderland Point. But if we want to do that, then it has to become economically viable because we just learned it's going to be very expensive to maintain. So Sunderland Point, it's going to turn into some sort of like a Disneyland land of the bay where people will go and visit life as it was in the past. Um, but in order to make it profitable, then we're going to have all of this uh, cheesy souvenir shops um, <laughs> along the street where you can go and buy Union you know, Jack mugs and magnets and so on. Again, he's not saying that that's what we should have, but it is a way of engaging with the complexity of the conversation. We can protect places, but how do we sustain that? And somebody else, um, when this group was working with ceramic panels, um, went full on, we do nothing and it's going to be the apocalypse. Um, <laughs> Yeah, with uh, Morcom, Eric Morcom with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, so engage with like what happens if we don't do anything. So all of this, in a sense, represents the hopes, the fears, the expectations of young people. Um, but it also, also like in the way in which they experience growing up in Morcom so far. We talked about what is sensible to do, but also what is possible based on their experience in growing up in a place where a lot of promises were made and then broken. And they hear from their parents how that had happened in the past. And so it is, if you look at all of this together, it's a very complex mosaic um, that talks about the way in which young people think about the future in a data supported way. So then we brought this discussion um, in an open event, in an event at the um, Midland Hotel um, in Morecambe, where we invited all of the schools that participated, as well as all of the experts and the partners that supported in one way or the other our project. Um, we had um, group discussions and we had an exhibition of uh, the students' work. Um, one of the things that we did is that we got groups of students taking experts around in the exhibition and the students were talking about their work but in talking about the artwork that they created they were also talking about very complex and very local and very important topics that the experts could respond to through their expertise. Um, it happens, um, one of the students who developed uh, an artwork about salt marshes, I don't know if I have it here, no. um, an artwork about salt marshes ended up talking with um, somebody who is thinking about salt marshes as a natural flood management solution. And so this person was asking like, why did you draw that? And that, that simple, what is that thing that you drew? Why did you draw that? Where did that come from? Becomes like, kind of like a hook to get a young 14 year old uh, person to talk to somebody who maybe a month ago uh, would have been completely, um, you know, like they would feel completely like self-conscious about engaging with. Um, so that was the purpose of the exhibition. And now we thought we need to take these things around, um, but the exhibition is not particularly important in itself. So we thought about, um, you know, when you go to the beach and you see these telescopes and you can see far ahead in space, so what if we had one that allowed you to see far ahead in time? Um, so we made our own. Um, I can pass these around and then there's, um, during the break, uh, there's a set of other cards. Um, if you ever use a Viewmaster, that's kind of the idea. Um, so this is the original uh, prototype that we had in the exhibition. We had it there and uh, students um, looked at this reel of images with all of their uh, predictions and all of their artworks. Um, 
really looked like. And then we made this other version, which is much more easier to produce. So we are planning to put the plans uh, available to other schools to make their own. And, and we used it for an exhibition at the Maritime Museum. So we brought this and the... Oh, and um, we tried to make this exhibition interactive because the idea is we worked with school, but actually is there a way of engaging the wider population into uh, this type of discourse? So we had the Timescapes uh, viewers, um, we had a map of the bay, um, there was a panel explained um, the different um, interventions that could be put in place. Uh, we got people to vote and add stickers to what they would see and why. And then we took people um, on a walk. Um, this is Joseph on the left, uh, who led the walk with us um, on the River Loom in Lancaster. Um, as kind of like a replica of what we did with the field work uh, with the students. So when we were walking around the Loon, we saw um, we saw elements of place, we saw uh, data and like signs of change that we could notice along the walk. We had pictures from the museum that showed us uh, the past. There's an amazing picture of the loon being completely frozen over, um, which, uh, you know, it's not something that happens anymore nowadays. Um, and then we also, as I said, brought the project to Sunderland Point as a different way of engaging. So, and, and obviously we brought it here. Um, so the idea is um, we are trying to find more and more ways to engage with different audiences and different communities to kind of bring this conversation, bring some of the artworks from the students into the room, uh, but also think about how else uh, we can um, expand this engagement and this community participation. Um, so, So this is this is our project, um, and on the back of this, we kept working together on a, on a number of uh, related projects. But um, yeah, uh, now it's all about bringing it out and engaging with different communities. And different people. Thank you. So if you have any questions before the break, um, and then Susie has a separate presentation. With, um, yeah, I'm just thinking that when we're talking about, we have another project. So Joseph, um, yeah, so. So Joseph is working on something we we'll call citizen science. Uh, I would say this is different than crowdsourcing. Uh, it's really engaging with the local community just north of Blackpool to look at you know, what the issues they have and how they like to engage and collect the data about it and learn about the environment. So this is something I'm going to say a little bit later and you know, might be some of you interested. But I think for the time being, it, it, it's a good just kind of to pause here and take some questions about timescapes. Okay, so I'm just going to just briefly, um, briefly introduce the project that Joseph, well, you heard of, he's working on uh, for his PhD. And, and the idea really came from all this involvement and listening stories like here today about how to really empower citizens with you know understanding and knowledge so they can they can challenge some of those solutions that are brought up um, um, in their in their local uh, areas and we do believe that local people know their local area the best um, and how you know we think about how we can capture that knowledge and understanding that it's going on there that was maybe you know built for centuries, kind of from story to story, from family to family, um, which is very important. We can use all this kind of satellite data and I don't know really modern sensors, which uh, give us some of information, but you know that's kind of like maybe temporal, but we don't know what happened in the past. And we come around and, and learning about um, that kind of knowledge understanding of channels moving, of beaches disappearing and coming back again on and on. 
So something that is not sometimes captured in that kind of data that we have, but it's somewhere out there that it's a kind of experiential knowledge. Um, so, um, so this is kind of like a bringing together that understanding and knowledge and really empowering, giving confidence people to challenge some of those decisions that are made for them rather than with them. Um, and it's a lot being done, and you probably heard a lot about citizen science. Um, often, actually, it's more crowdsourcing in a way. So uh, local uh, communities are collecting the data for some of researchers. I don't know, they may be taking water samples, or they might be just <laughs> measuring temperature in their garden, or perhaps just doing some uh, modeling for uh, climate research. But here, we really wanted to go down to a, a bone and really start with discussions first on the local level. What the issues are there? What are the concerns? Or how we can work together around these concerns? What data we need? <coughs> what understanding we need and how we can take that further. So it's really enhanced understanding of environmental issues, but it's really working together. Uh, and it's this kind of two way of sharing knowledge and data. So we have access to some of the data that are monitored around, and we can explain that, but as I said, that kind of experiential knowledge there we might not have. And it's really kind of uh, bringing that to the confidence that Everybody knows what's all that presented to them and, and really can challenge. So that's kind of like the aim, an idea where we would like to go. Um, so how we started. Um, so um, we uh, just started to work with a, a local um, community group. It's Russell uh, uh, Beach Volunteers. We're actually doing beach cleaning, and so as you might understand, you know, probably uh, uh, guess, a lot of them, their concern is beach cleaners, rather than maybe something that is so far concern, whether the beach is going to be there in, in 10, 100 years, and how it's changing. So Joseph actually worked very uh, closely with that group, uh, having workshops, and, and really gathering other kind of issues that might, uh, might concern them. And so slowly, you know, they're providing information about anything that they see out when they go out. So many of them are out twice per day, walking dogs, and see the changes. And so register that with the camera and sharing, sharing the information, which, which is useful for us. Um, Can you give and us an example of changes they might have seen then? Sorry? Can you give it as an example of any changes? So, for example, uh, so some of these kind of channels next to the groins are changing, or uh, there are some of those kind of bars which are moving in and out. And actually, recently, what got exposed that, that kind of sand moved away, and then we got exposed that kind of deposits, uh, very old deposits of kind of um, uh, petrified forest. So, you know, things like that that we don't know when, when that happens. So, it's really, really useful. Um, so, but basically, as, as you know, the, uh, this kind of like relationship started to build. So um, and now, you know, there are some groups that are moving into doing survey, geomorphological survey, and the other groups are doing ecological survey because that's of their interest. So it's really kind of looking the interest of the group and how you know how we can contribute to getting the information from. The area. So, um, yeah. So this is kind of like um, example. On the on the left is by master students who actually started on this project before Joseph. So organized. We organized a couple of workshops and just taking taking the images with a mobile phone we could create that kind of a beach 3D model. And so, you know, the idea is that if you go out and take these images, you can start to build a model and look at the changes. I'm also presenting, showing here another kind of uh, citizen science, um, um, let's say, um, worldwide citizen science uh, project. 
which is slightly different, which is actually using the images that people are sending. So it's not really working with local people, but it made actually really useful database all around the world because um, people walking on the coast, you know, taking images, sending back to actually uh, places um, that are running these models and then from that looking at the changes. So what I want to say here, um, there is a way of being involved, looking into, you know, uh, investigating the changes and working with us. And if anyone is interested in anything of that, so we are welcome um, to, to talk and, and, and get engaged. Okay, so. I'll finish with this lovely uh, photo. That, that's the photo from here. Don't know whether Arnold Price might be here, but um, that, that's actually a photo that was sent to me by, by Peter uh, years ago. Beautiful uh, things that it's actually very much here, uh, Silverdale and on site area. Okay, thank you.